Two years ago, I was on my second week backpacking through the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. I had finally reached a point where I was too exhausted to walk any longer. It was a scorching day. I had blisters all over my feet and was ready to call it quits. I was in the middle of nowhere and decided to thumb a lift to the nearest town. But I was out of luck. I stood there for what felt like hours and no car would pick me up. I don't blame them. I had spent the last two weeks sleeping in the woods. My clothes were dirty and I probably looked like a maniac. When finally, a truck pulled up. I didn't hesitate to hop inside because I was so thankful to be able to sit down and rest my feet for a while. I asked the driver if he could drop me at the nearest town so that I could catch a bus to San Francisco. He told me he was heading there too and could take me all the way as long as I didn't mind him making a stopover to load the truck. I didn't and so we drove along. We made some small talk, and he seemed to be very polite. It was a pretty enjoyable ride until we reached the first stop. He loaded his truck while I walked around and bought some water at a nearby gas station. He offered me drinks a few times along the ride, but I always declined because I was uncomfortable with that. I returned to the truck and we continued the drive to San Francisco. Almost immediately after we took off again, he told me it wouldn't be a problem for him if I wanted to remove some clothes since it was such a hot day. I told him I was fine, but he repeatedly brought it up. He also asked me if I wanted to take a nap in the back and that he had several hitchhikers sleep there in the past. I declined again starting to feel a little uneasy around him. I planned to leave the truck at the next service station. Suddenly, he yelled at me to put my head down and hide because he was driving past his stepfather's car and he didn't want him to see me in the truck. That was more than weird, but I did it anyway because his yelling surprised me which definitely confirmed my need to get out of there as soon as possible. I asked him to drop me off at the next stop and made up an excuse that my goal was to enter San Francisco by foot. He agreed, and I got my stuff ready. Suddenly, he turned to me and said that I looked familiar. He was sure he had seen me somewhere before. I shrugged it off but he insisted he remembered my face. He asked me if I had ever gone to a swingers club because he was sure he had seen me there sometime. That caught me off guard. We were past weird now and moving on to something worse. I told him that was impossible because I'd never been to one. He said, well, do you want to? I'm going to one in San Francisco. Let's go there together. I'm sure you'll like it. I wanted out of that truck, ASAP. I told him that I had no intention of coming with him and asked him to drop me off now. He didn't answer, but reached into his pants and started playing with himself while he drove. I froze up, clutching my backpack on my lap. I didn't know what to do. I kept thinking I'd jump out as soon as he stopped somewhere and tried to ignore what he was doing. He only stopped touching himself as we approached a gas station, and that was to ask me if we should take a shower together. I figured that there'd be people around and that it would make it easier to get rid of him. So I told him, sure, why not? He pulled up, and as soon as he stopped, I yanked open the door and ran across the gas station parking area, hoping that he wouldn't come after me. He didn't, only after my heart stopped racing and I caught my breath did I realize that I'd left my shoes in the truck. 
I walked the last few miles barefoot, keeping a lookout for his sleazemobile until I reached San Francisco. I was traveling around Australia during my gap year. It had always been a dream of mine to rent a camper van and drive the length and breadth of the Gold Coast Road. From there, I headed down to Melbourne and then back up to Adelaide. Traveling solo, I was far from lonely, thanks to the various characters I met along the way. Each day was an adventure, and each night was a party with new faces. Pals for a few hours, and then you'd never see them again. But of all the people I met on that trip, two left a lasting impression. I was on my last few days in Australia when I met Mickey and Jacko at a small roadside eatery just outside of Adelaide. They seemed like fun guys, friendly and up for a good time. I spent the evening with them, drinking a few beers under the stars. As the night drew to a close, they asked if I could give them a lift to this little town significantly off my planned route. Politely, I declined, explaining that I wasn't heading in that direction. They seemed slightly disappointed but dismissed it with a casual shrug and a, no worries mate. I wished them both well and said that I hoped they have a nice life if we didn't meet again. Since I was living out of my camper van to save money, I was sleeping in there too. So, I hopped inside my vehicle, a little dizzy from the night's drinking, and fell asleep in the back almost immediately. I woke up in the middle of the night to rumbling and the sound of tires on dirt. My van's engine was roaring while I was sleeping in the back. Someone had got their hands on my keys and was now driving my vehicle to God knows where with me still in the back. I started shouting, hey, stop. But all I heard in reply was laughter and hollering. Familiar laughter. It was Jacko's. I'd heard it all night. The question was, where the hell was he taking me? To the town I wouldn't drive him to? On the world's most joyless joyride? Looking out the window, I could see another car following ours. It was Mickey, which made no sense. If they had a car, why had they asked me for a ride? Whatever was happening was not good, in a really bad way. I took out my phone to call for help, no signal. Panic set in as I realized we had already gotten that far out of town. I looked out the window again to see we were in the outback. Because of the partition between the front and rear of the van, I couldn't get to Jacko. I couldn't jump out of the back of the van either, given the speed at which we were moving. Plus, Mickey was still right behind us, and from what I could tell, we were pretty much in the middle of nowhere. I kept yelling at Jacko, shouting for him to pull over. He ignored me. We kept driving for what seemed like an eternity, my mind swirling with horrific scenarios about what they were going to do to me, or whether I'd survive it. Eventually, we came to a stop. Outside, there was only desolation. No lights in any direction for as far as the eye could see. The real Australian outback, isolated and inhospitable. Without a word, Jacko jumped out of the van, ran back to Mickey's car, and hopped inside. They did donuts around my van, kicking up dust all around them. I could hear them laughing and taunting me, yelling, Yeah, mate, have a nice life, as they drove away and disappeared from view. The van itself was almost out of gas. I had no phone signal. If I couldn't get a hold of anyone, I was dead. I had two choices. Sit in my vehicle and make use of the weak air conditioning while I could, or hop out and walk in a random direction in hopes of finding help, though who knew how far away that might be. It's infamously perilous to travel into the outback without shade or supplies. Most people only last a few days. The sun was rising, and it was supposed to be a scorching day. I was dehydrated from the night before, and only had one small bottle of water in the back of the van. So, I waited. After a harrowing 20 hours, a helicopter overhead miraculously spotted me. I was unconscious by the time the rescuers found me. I was later told how lucky I was. Drinking my water quickly instead of sipping it, not exerting myself and making use of the air conditioner is what likely saved me. After leaving the hospital, I was on the next flight home, but made sure to give a complete and detailed description of the two guys who did this to me. I didn't wait around to see if they were ever found. Whenever I read about people losing their lives in the outback, I think about Mickey and Jacko. And whenever I take a road trip, I sleep with the keys under my pillow. I 
I grew up in a somewhat secluded, rustic town in rural Minnesota. It was one of those places where everyone knew everyone else, and few people passed through. During my teenage years, my friends and I often walked, took a bus, or, when we were feeling more adventurous, hitchhiked to different locations. It was early evening, summertime, and still way too hot outside. My friend Marcy and I were returning home after spending the afternoon at the mall in the next town over. We walked alongside the highway, thumbs outstretched, hoping for someone to offer us a ride. This older guy, probably in his 50s, stopped when he saw us. He was driving a weathered pickup truck with bench seats that could fit three people. I slid in beside him, with Marcy by my side, closest to the door. The guy seemed nice, and asked the usual stuff about where we were going and what we'd been doing. He told us he was going our way and would happily take us home. On the ride, he joked around with us, telling stories and whatnot. After a few miles, without warning, he veered off the highway onto an obscure access road. I immediately started to get uneasy. This was not the way home, not any route I knew anyway. Marcy, still lost in conversation, seemed unaware of the detour. My dread turned into blaring alarm bells as he turned sharply onto a gravel road leading to an abandoned rock quarry and stopped. In a movement charged with complete terror, I reached over Marcy's body, swung the door open, and pushed her out. My voice pierced the night air as I told her to run. The man lunged for me, but I managed to swing my arm around, nailing him in the face. I jumped out and took off after Marcy. It was dark out by this time, so we ran deep into the quarry and hid easily. We watched, our hearts pounding, as the man killed his headlights and slowly drove around in circles. We could no longer see him, but the gravel under his tires let us know he was still there. After what seemed like hours, it had been silent long enough for us to figure he had finally gone. Seizing the opportunity, we crept towards a chain link fence, deciding to climb over it and get back to the highway access road. Marcy went over first, and as I started to climb, I suddenly heard the sound of an engine start up. I looked back. The guy flipped his headlights on and gunned his pickup directly towards me. I scrambled over the fence before he could crush me, and we both took off running. We crossed the highway access road and ran into the woods on the other side. We lay in a ditch to catch our breath and hide. We heard his car get back onto the road, passing back and forth as he looked for us. We stayed hidden until, eventually, he gave up and drove off. We managed to walk the rest of the way home where we called the police and gave them his description. As far as I know, he was never found. This happened more than 30 years ago when I was still a teenager. I hadn't yet gotten my driver's license, so I walked most places or caught rides with friends. On occasion, I would hitchhike. This was back when people did that sort of thing. I was working late that night, having pulled a double shift after one of my coworkers called in sick. It had been a long day, and I was just too exhausted to walk home. Whenever I'd hitch a ride, I usually wouldn't get in a car with a lone man. Only women, and sometimes men with wives or girlfriends in the car, 
or had kids inside. This night, well, this night, I didn't stick to my rules. I had excuses, of course. There weren't many cars traveling this late, and those that went by were few and far between. And it was cold, and I was tired, and I didn't feel like walking. You always try to find good excuses for dumb decisions. So, when he pulled over, I took a good look at him. He was a scrawny guy, probably in his mid-thirties. He had a strange frailness about him, even though he looked healthy enough. Frankly, if he did try anything, I figured I could take him. That's how frail he looked. And back then, I considered myself to be pretty brave and tough. Silly now. But that's how you think when you're young. I went ahead and got in the car, and we quickly discussed where I was going. We exchanged names and made some small talk. He spoke quietly, asking a few questions about whether I was a local and how long I'd lived around here. That sort of stuff. He tells me he's only lived in the area for a couple of months, but found it beautiful and hoped he could find happiness here. That comment struck me as a bit odd, but I brushed it off. It began to snow and the road quickly got slippery. So he slowed down and kept his eyes peeled to the windshield, driving silently. I was okay with that, as small talk was never my forte. About 10 minutes later, I noticed that a car near the intersection we were approaching seemed to be sliding sideways. So I yelled, watch out. He immediately hit the gas, shooting through the intersection and shouted, don't ever scream at me. Needless to say, I was taken aback. I said, look, this is close enough. Just pull over here and I can walk the rest of the way. He didn't seem to hear me. Um, David, did you hear me? I said you can pull over here and let me out. No response. He just stared straight ahead, driving faster now than he had been since it began to snow. To say I was scared doesn't seem to cover the depth of the fear that arose in me. I didn't know if I should stay quiet or speak, but I was damn sure I wasn't going to yell after his outburst. After about a mile, he began to mumble under his breath. I couldn't quite make out what he was saying, but I assumed he was speaking to me. So I said, what? I couldn't hear you. He began to talk quietly and rapidly, saying things like, you're always yelling at me. I've repeatedly told you that I do not appreciate being yelled at, but do you listen? No. Well, I'm done listening to you now. Do you hear that? I was at a complete loss. I didn't know what to say in response or if I should say anything at all. I contemplated just jumping out of the car but nixed that idea when I realized the door lock was missing. There was just a silver lined hole where it should have been. I'd started to cry and debated with myself about causing an accident by grabbing the wheel and hoping for the best. At least I figured there was a chance I'd survive that. He suddenly looked at me for the first time since I had gotten into the car. He blinked several times rapidly, then slowed the car, pulling into a gas station. I waited to see if he'd unlock the doors, not wanting to say anything to set him off again. After a minute or two, he quietly said, I think I better let you out here and hit the button to open the locks. I wasn't about to hesitate. I jumped out of the car as if it were on fire. I was about to turn and walk into the gas station when he called my name. He looked so damned sad, I hesitated. He apologized, said he was sorry if he'd frightened me, that he never would have harmed me, and asked if I'd be able to get home okay. I said I would and closed the door. He began to pull out of the gas station lot, 
but stopped suddenly. He just sat there for a couple of moments, his head down. I froze, wondering what the hell he was up to, and was about to run into the station. But he opened his window and yelled to me, waving something in his hand. My hat. I'd left it on his seat. I warily approached his side of the car, and he handed it to me, apologizing again. I didn't know what else to say, so I just said, Thanks. I watched as he drove off, making sure he was out of sight before moving on, so he wouldn't know which direction I was heading. As I walked, I went to put my hat back on, and out fell a piece of paper. Folded into the paper was a $20 bill. The paper said, I'm sorry. Please take a cab and don't hitchhike anymore tonight. I didn't. Not ever again. Thanks for watching and please subscribe.